the Khasi Department of the Northeastern Hill University, in collaboration with the Khasi Authors Society, organized a special lecture by Professor Andrew J. May, School of Historical and Philosophical Studies, Melbourne University, Australia. The topic of the lecture was on British imperial journalism, the special roving correspondent and the construction of remoter India in 1891-92. The occasion was graced by the Minister of Arts and Culture, Government of Meghalaya, Paul Lingdo, as chief guest and Professor R. H. Duncan of the Chemistry Department of Nehu as the guest of honour. In his inaugural address, Paul Lingdor emphasized the need to preserve the original identity of a community based on the three fundamental elements of land, language and clan, even as the public has acknowledged traits of other cultures. He reiterated the fact that land, language and clan or Kakhndo, Kakhtin and Kakur are the three cases of positive nomenclature in Khasi, unlike the negative metaphor that used to prevail in the past. The exhaustive lecture was delivered by Professor Andrew J. May as he presented the imperial notion of the ethnic Khasi community as written by British journalists of the colonial period between 1891-92, particularly by MacDonald. Andrew May pointed out that there are aspects of catasgatory remarks against the alien culture, though several inherent folk knowledge was found in the manuscript, which people were not aware of. Professor Andrew May also spoke extensively on the role of Christian missionaries in the interpretation of the Khasi tradition that was reflected in literature, which contains diverse opinions on the community. The lecture session was chaired by Professor D. R. L. Nonglai, Head of Khasi Department at Nehu and President of the Khasi Author Society, while the introduction was presented by Professor Desmond L. Karmaoplang of the Department of Cultural and Creative Studies, Northeastern Hill University. For the Khasi, more than for any other, he writes, it is a key to the secrets of his gods. In his thousands of works, if you put all these columns together, you, you could put together a big book. In his thousands of works, while well, written in the hills, MacDonald never mentions an individual Kasi by name, but assures his reader that there are no more prosperous and more contented British subjects than the Kasis and the Sintens. Key interlocutors in MacDonald's version of the Kasi hills were Welsh missionaries, John Roberts, Griffith Griffiths, C. L. Stevens. And the missionaries are generally characterised as benign agents of British and Christian values. They are said to encourage converts to bear it rather than cremate their dead, for example, yet tolerate ancient practices. Quote, the missionaries very sensibly do not interfere in this matter, but are ready to recognise both methods of disposing of the dead. At Cherokunji, MacDonald accompanied Roberts and Griffiths to Sunday services, as well as on visits to the sick at night to the Hurricane Mansion to guide their way through the perilous terrain to ward off tigers. MacDonald's final letter from Cherokunji, titled Devil Worship and Christian Missions, describes the religion of the Cussies, including human sacrifice to the flesh or certain god as pretending to higher forms of faith. MacDonald invokes Scottish poet Michael Bruce's The Complaint of Nature, uh, 1764, based on Job 14, uh, 1 to 15, or popular hymns of the early to the 19th century. Like the Old Testament figure, the Cassie stumbles on the question of theodicy, which is why, why does God permit evil in the world? The single child of nature can only attribute the tyrannies of war, famine, plague, earthquake, and any other disaster to the gods, and with an unsophisticated logic can only surmise that the gods are devils. MacDonald notes, however, that Christianity was advancing in the hills, out of a population of 170,000, nearly 9,000 were converts, while the recently established Catholic mission was also making inroads. There were over 171 churches, 
uh, 4,000 children in schools, a theological college with the most up-to-date textbooks, as well as a missionary hospital and dispensary. These Welsh Presbyterians, McDonald concluded, have done for the Carsis what the early fathers did for England and most countries of Europe. They have given them literature and written symbols. The whole missionary business in the Kasi Hills is very wonderful. Very wonderful that thousands of such people should regard the practices of their own kith and kin with as much horror as if they were the congregation of Brunswick Chapel in Newcastle. From there, MacDonald makes his descent down the south face of the hills to the tableland, uh, takes a train, uh, then a country boat down the river to Silpet. After a stay in Kachar and following descriptions there, MacDonald's journey, journey threads through Calcutta, Darjeeling, Hongkor, Agra, Delhi, and Jaipur. As he rested at Darjeeling, in the site of the marching country Dunga, he formulated a final judgment on India's diverse races and religions. The country is, quote, a perfect Manguga, unquote. Cautioning any of his readers, giving over, quote, given over to the extraordinary delusion that there is such a thing as the Indian people, he summarised that India is not a country at all, but a vast region comprising many countries a conglomeration of races, nationalities and religion, more different even than the English from the French, and kept from flying afresh at each other's throats only by the strong and merciful rule of Great Britain. From Agra, MacDonald rehearsed two great tenets of his imperial perspective, that the British government had not displaced a single native dynasty in India, and second, that the native dynasties who still survive owe their power and stability to the British government, giving to the peoples, instead of their tyrannies and misgovernments, the benefits of settled rule, freedom, peace, and security. 